Okay, um, I think we'll try and make a start. Welcome everybody um, to this really important training on planning for flood risk. Um, my name is uh, Hugh Ellis and I'm Director of Policy at the Town and Country Planning Association. And we're running these sessions in conjunction with the Environment Agency as part of a partnership to communicate the really important issues about planning for climate change and specifically today planning for flood risk. Um, I have a promise to all of you that this is a very focused session. So just looking at the agenda, we will be finished um, at or before 1.30 in the hope that these sessions are useful to you, sort of fitting into your lunchtime. Um, and I'm therefore not going to say very much about the climate crisis. We can assume, I guess, people on this call all fulfil really vital functions uh, in planning and the built environment in relation to how we manage the climate crisis. And the only thing I would say about it is that I think we need to normalize the conversation about the scale of the challenge that we face, a conversation which I think many people and sometimes politicians can't quite face. And those figures about sea level rise, those figures about extreme weather, figures about where we're going to be with peak river flow, all mean that we have to go through a practical process of redesigning places, but also quite a psychological process that these impacts are locked into the climate system now because of our inaction. And we therefore have to plan in an unprecedented way to deal with those issues. Uh, of all of those issues in the current approach to flood risk, um, I think the, the exceptions, uh, 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 the sequential approach and the exceptions test are two of the ones that I think have caused most sort of questions back at us. And this training session fits into part of a, a program that we're developing um which uh, of e-learning which which will be launched over the coming months with the environment agency to support practitioners particularly in the local plan uh, process so we've got the challenge of climate change and the challenge of planning reform but the only thing i would say about that is with the leveling up bill uh, uh, in theory about to become law and the new system that goes into that i think it's absolutely vital that the, you see these issues as areas of continuity they're not going away. The sorts of policy will still apply, whatever the new local plan framework looks like and wherever you are in it. And they are absolutely critical issues to get right. So the way this hour will work is that we're really lucky to have Sam Kipling from the Environment Agency, who is going to run through um, a presentation that describes the policy and how you need to apply it. Then there is a little bit of time for Q&A, but not very much. And my apologies for that if that's frustrating. But if you put questions into the Q&A function, we are capturing them um, and we will, we're will we going to respond to them in the way that the training is designed over the next few months. So it's really important that you contribute there. Um, so without wasting any more of anyone's time, I want to introduce Sam. Um, and Sam, you, um, uh, I, I know, are not feeling brilliantly well. So thank you so much for doing this session um, with all these really important messages. At the very end of this session, I'm also going to point you to a, um, a survey the Environment Agency is, is, is uh, uh, looking for coastal authorities to take part in and also some resources that the TCPA and the RTPI have published in relation to this. So, Sam, thank you so much for doing this, and I will hand over to you. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining in such large numbers and taking time out from your, no doubt, very busy busy day jobs. Um, so, yes, I have the unen un unenviable task of, uh, of trying to explain the sequential and exception test. Um, I will do my best, but I know it is a sometimes confusing uh, area of policy, but it is, it is, I think, one of the most important ones. Uh, next slide, please. So the planning practice guidance now sets out this hierarchical approach to considering and addressing flood risk. Uh, at the top of the hierarchy is uh, assess. Uh, we first, of course, have to understand all sources of current and future flood risk uh, before we can start thinking about what we might want to do about them. Um, there is a, a follow-up webinar next Wednesday um, about site-specific flood risk assessments, um, and in due course there will be another one on strategic flood risk assessments. Um, but today we're dealing with the avoidance part of this hierarchy. Uh, next slide, please. Before I speak a bit more about the sequential test, um, before we consider the sequential and exception test, it's worth starting with a check whether a proposed development is fundamentally incompatible uh, with the flood risk uh, on any particular site. And we do this by referring to table two of the planning practice guidance. So this combines the vulnerability classification of the development 
with the flood zone and it sets out circumstances where um, it suggests that development should not be permitted. If development is incompatible, that alone is likely to be grounds for refusal and there isn't really a need to go on to consider the sequential or the exception test in those circumstances. You'll see that the most common instance is in functional floodplain in flood zone 3B, where uh, highly vulnerable, more vulnerable and less vulnerable development is precluded. Highly vulnerable development in flood zone 3A also falls into this category. So it's an important first stage uh, of the process to check compatibility in table two. Next, day, next slide, please. So why is the concept of avoidance, which is enshrined in the sequential test, uh, front and centre in the very first paragraph uh, of the flood section in the National Planning Policy Framework? Uh, well, Benjamin Franklin famously coined this phrase, uh, whilst I think he was talking about wildfire, he was definitely onto something. Uh, avoidance is the most effective approach because it keeps people and property safer than if, if development is located in areas at flood, flood risk. The sequential test makes clear that we should avoid building in areas of flood risk unless we absolutely have to. Next slide, please. But why is avoidance best? Well, we have very short term certainty about our ability to build new and improve existing flood defences. Uh, the current uh, capital programme is a six year process. And when you compare that to the period of the lifetime of a new development that we're considering a minimum of 100 years with residential development there's a lot a lot of uncertainty in, in whether we can rely on on flood defenses uh, over those periods next slide please we maintain uh, over 7000 kilometers of flood defenses walls embankments on on main rivers uh, and sometimes unfortunately they they fail uh, so even if you're dealing with development in a place that is um, behind flood defences, we have to consider the, the potential consequences of flood defence failure, the failure of other flood risk assets. Uh, there are some examples here in the slide. Um, next slide, please. Flood defences also only provide protection to a particular standard, uh, and often uh, flood events will take place which it will exceed the standard for which the flood defence was designed. Uh, Keswick uh, famously had shiny new flood defences, glass-topped flood defences, no less, but, but soon after they were constructed, uh, experienced an event that exceeded their standard of protection. Next slide, please. There are also lots of flood defences that um, rely on human intervention to operate effectively. Uh, things like uh, lock gates, uh, tidal barriers, things like that, where because of their active nature, um, there's the risk of mechanical or electrical failure or human, human error. Next slide, please. Active measures um, also rely on human intervention. So some examples here, is we have some demountable flood defences uh, in Upton on Severn. These famously got stuck in a lorry on the M5 motorway when a flood hit in 2007. Um, flood protection measures like demountable flood barriers on houses, um, sometimes people are on holiday or with 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 family when a flood uh, a flood hits. Uh, an example of this was the Boxing Day floods of 2015. Many people got a flood warning, but they were away from home, so were unable to put their uh, flood barriers in place. We also sometimes get flood forecasting or flood warning wrong. Uh, here's Michael Fish from 1987, famously failing to spot the imminent arrival of a of a hurricane. So avoidance. Gives, gives residents the best possible chance uh, of being able to access affordable house insurance as well, a, a really critical element of, of resilience. And we're finding that insurance companies are paying increasing attention uh, to property level in interventions and, and their effect on, on premiums. Next slide, please. Avoiding flood risk areas can also have really significant carbon benefits as well in the context of climate change mitigation. So flood events tend to have a substantial carbon footprint because of the flood damage that's caused. There's a, an image here from, from Churchtown in Lancashire. Uh, it gives you some idea of the amount of, uh, of waste that results from, from a damaging flood. Um, and every replacement piece of, of carpet, of furniture, of belongings uh, has an associated carbon footprint. Um, 
avoiding flood risk areas obviously uh, alleviates the pressure, the need for 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 defences to be to be maintained and improved or constructed afresh in future. Uh, and for defence and for defences, particularly concrete ones, often have a very large uh, carbon footprint. Um, avoidance also maximises opportunities to reconnect rivers uh, and the sea to their natural floodplains, uh, and that comes with huge opportunities for the storing of carbon, uh, known as as blue as blue carbon. So, what level of flood risk is needed to trigger the potential need for the sequential test? Um, obviously, the flood zones, flood zones two and three, are the most common triggers. Um, but the sequential test is now triggered by all sources of current and future flood risk. So in the first instance, you'll need to refer to your strategic flood risk assessment um, to work out whether on any particular site, whether there are other sources of flood risk or whether a site uh, could be at risk uh, of uh, increased risk of flooding in the future due to climate change. Um, if your strategic flood risk assessment is, uh, is out of date, um, you might need to refer to the Environment Agency's CHOP, Check Your Long-Term Flood Risk Digital Service, which provides information on surface water flood risk uh, and reservoir risk, and of course the flood map for planning for information on the latest flood zones. Next slide, please. So the flood risk information tells you if there's the possibility that the sequential test will need to be applied. But next, next you have to work out whether the development in question is exempt from the sequential test or not. You'd be forgiven for thinking that there are two types of development class, minor development and major development. And because the MPPF exempts minor development from the sequential test, you might understandably come to the conclusion that all development falling into what you think of as the, the minor development category is exempt. But in this context, at least, there are in fact three categories of development. Perhaps what you thought was minor development is in this context known as non-major development. It's pretty confusing. Um, but the important thing to realize is that there are three classifications, minor, non-major and major development. And it's only minor development, the definition on the left, which is exempt from the sequential test. So a proposal for a single dwelling would be subject to the sequential test. Um, I'm stressing this point because we did a survey with the TCPA a couple of years ago, and it was apparent that many local authorities were not applying the sequential test to that non-major development category. Um, so that is now much clearer in, in the planning practice guidance. Uh, so do make sure that it's being applied appropriately, appropriately on, on relevant development. Uh, next slide, please. There are a number of other exemptions. So change of use development is exempt, um, except uh, changes to uh, caravan sites and the like. Development that comes forward on a site that's been allocated in your local plan uh, are only exempt if they were sequentially tested at the local plan stage when the site was allocated. That the proposed development is consistent with the use for which it was allocated. So if it's a site that was allocated for a commercial use, and housing development comes forward, then the sequential test would need to be revisited. And the other, or the other caveat is that there mustn't have been any significant changes to flood risk that would have changed the outcome of the test. So just, just because you're dealing with the development on an allocated site, you need to make sure that those criteria have been met as well. Next slide, please. So planning guidance is, is much clearer now that it's down to the local planning authority, not the applicant to determine the search area for the test and to undertake the test itself uh, with reference to the information that local authorities hold on land availability. Planning guidance encourages local authorities to take steps to improve the consistency uh, and certainty and efficiency of the sequential test by producing local guidance, perhaps as part of your strategic flood risk assessments. Um, Guidance on, for example, the appropriate search areas that would apply to common development types, a ranking methodology that allows you to compare the relative risk um, between a number of different sites, and particularly accounting for complexities like multiple sources of flood risk and uh, how flood risk might change in future due to climate change. In an ideal world, local authorities will also keep a register of reasonably available sites with their flood risk ranking and their status kept up to date so that when a planning application lands, you can really quickly and easily refer to that register to establish if there's a, a likely prospect of the sequential test being satisfied. 
The role of the applicant is now quite limited um, to check for any open market sites that uh, the, information, the local authority doesn't already hold information about and perhaps confirming the status uh, of any sites that have been um, identified, so making sure they're up to date. The Environment Agency uh, doesn't get involved in detail in the sequential test for individual planning applications, uh, but our staff have been asked to um, flag the need for the sequential test in our planning responses, so local authorities are clear when it's required. Um, worth flagging that there are circumstances where we're not a statutory consultee when the sequential test will apply, so we, we obviously can't remind you in those circumstances. Um, the only other aspect that we, we might get involved with is advising on relative risk. So if, if a local authority is unclear if a reasonably available alternative site is lower risk or not, we might be able to provide some advice on, on, on that. Next slide, please. So the next important stage is defining the search area for the sequential test. Um, the local plan spatial strategy and particular evidence on housing need and housing market areas are likely to be important considerations when uh, determining an appropriate search area. Um, the local authority boundary should usually be the backstop, um, but there will be development specific and spatial circumstances that allow that search area to be shrunk down to something smaller. Um, planning guidance advocates for a fairly pragmatic pragmatic approach when proposals are uh, come forward which are where developments operationally link to an existing use and extension of a business for example and um, so there's a degree of flexibility on on that but it's a very important part of the process next slide please guidance encourages local authorities to um, come up with a ranking methodology um, a ranking methodology isn't prescribed nationally because uh, there isn't a one size fits all approach that would work in all locations. So it's important that you give this uh, some consideration, um, ideally as part of your strategic flood risk assessment, um, so that you can come up with a local ranking methodology that, that works for your, for your particular area. Um, alongside the Environment Agency's How to Prepare a Strategic Flood Risk Assessment Guidance is the SFRA Good Practice Guide, and that includes a number of case studies, examples where local authorities have produced a ranking methodology. Uh, and if you refer to that, it will give you some ideas about how to come up with one for your area. For me, the big factors in coming up with a ranking methodology are things like risk to life. So is, is, the, is, the, is flood risk uh, hazardous in a, in a particular location? Uh, displacement. So is flood risk serious enough, serious enough that it would displace people from their homes? And this is important as it has the biggest effect on the mental health impacts of flood risk. Flood frequency is another one because of the disruption and repeated damage that can, can result from that. And depth, flood depth and flood duration are also the biggest factors uh, related to property flood damage as well. So various factors there that, that are worthy of consideration in, in coming up with the man ranking methodology. Next slide, please. Planning guidance now includes um, a much clearer definition of what constitutes reasonably available. Um, it's clear that sites could include a series of smaller sites or part of a larger site. Uh, it's clear that uh, a planning applicant doesn't need to own any alternative uh, sites that are identified, so ownership is not a consideration. And guidance is also clear now that um, land supply isn't a consideration for applying the sequential test to individual applications either. So if your lo local authority doesn't have a five-year land supply, um, then it's not a valid consideration for um, saying that all sites are needed and therefore the sequential test uh, doesn't need to be applied or is automatically satisfied. Next slide, please. So when is it OK to move on from the sequential test? Well, the exception test is often wrongly thought about as the way to sort of bypass the rule that we steer development away from flood risk areas. Um, but I don't see it as that at all. Um, it's an additional hurdle that has to be passed if and only if the sequential test has failed to find suitable lower risk sites. I like to think of it instead as a test of whether the proposed development is sufficiently outstanding, um, fantastic, exceptional, to justify it in a flood risk area uh, when there are no alternatives. So 
um, try to make sure that you think about it in that way rather than it being a sort of get out clause or um, get out of jail free card, if you like. Next slide, please. But is it ever appropriate to move on from the sequential test when alternative lower risk sites have been identified? Um, yes, it is, but only when application of relevant local and national policies would provide a clear reason for refusing development on any alternative locations identified. So it sets a really, a really high bar. And if no, no such reason exists, the MPPF is clear in, in paragraph 162 that development should not be permitted. Next slide, please. So if the sequential test has failed to identify suitable low risk sites, or if there are clear reasons why you'd refuse development on those alternative sites, you'll then need to check if the exception test is also needed. And you do this with reference to table two in the planning practice guidance. It provides two additional tests that need to be satisfied. That's in addition to the usual requirement that any development in an area of flood risk must be shown to be safe for its lifetime without increasing flood risk elsewhere. The, ad the additional tests are that development will provide wider sustainability benefits to the community, which outweigh the flood risk, and where possible development will reduce flood risk overall. It's the applicant's responsibility to provide local authorities uh, with the evidence needed to demonstrate how both elements of the test will be uh, satisfied. And the Environment Agency's uh, role will be to advise on the flood risk elements of the, of the test, particularly the second part. Next slide, please. Planning guidance now gives some examples of what might constitute wider sustainability benefits to the community. Um, but local authorities are encouraged to set out uh, their own criteria uh, with reference to your sustainability appraisal framework. Um, but it, a number of examples are given. So, for example, the use of uh, previously developed land, perhaps as part of a uh, identified regeneration area. And um, it could be a financial contribution to flood defences that would benefit the wider community or perhaps the inclusion of sustainable drainage systems or green infrastructure, uh, which significantly exceeds uh, minimum standards. Other examples could include things like land contamination remediation, uh, additional provision of affordable housing, and perhaps the provision of community facilities of some sort. Next slide, please. The, the requirement that development should reduce flood risk overall where possible um, places the onus, to my mind, on applicants to show that such men measures can't be identified and, and delivered or, or that those measures are unfeasible. Um, so some examples given are perhaps creating a flood storage area, perhaps uh, through the use of green infrastructure, through the use of sustainable drainage systems, which might remove surface water from existing combined sewers, or maybe providing or contributing to flood defences with, with wider benefits. Next slide, please. Once you've identified those wider sustainability benefits to the community and assessed the flood risk in the site-specific flood risk assessment, they then need to be balanced against one another in the, the, the sort of weighing up process that the exception test describes. I see this as being very much like the opposite of the tilted balance of the presumption in favour of sustainable development, where instead the balance is tipped in favour of a refusal of development in flood risk areas. So those wider sustainability benefits to the community need to be need to be really compelling. Um, not only do you have to take into account the disbenefits associated uh, with with flooding on the sort of refusal side of the balance, um, but you also need to in, take into account the effect that flood risk might have on eroding or undermining the arguments that are perhaps in favour of approving development. So, for instance, if an area is subject to frequent flooding, then the economic benefits that might flow from a development might be undermined by the disruption or damage that's, that might be caused by flooding in that location. So we need to be uh, cognizant of how flood risk could affect both sides of that equation. Right, so that concludes, I think, my main walkthrough of um, the sequential and exception test. And we're now going to move on to some uh, to some questions. Are we doing this via a, 
uh, a poll or an in interactive Q&A. Right, here we go. So uh, just to make sure that you've all been, been paying attention, question one. So I'm going to ask you whether or not this development is incompatible with the flood zone with reference to table two of the planning guidance. And then going to ask whether you think the sequential test is or is not required and also whether the exception test is required. So this first example is a, a demolition of an existing commercial unit, uh, constructing a new replacement commercial unit uh, with a floor space of 890 square meters. It's in flood zone two and it's a windfall application. So it's not an allocated site. So if you can answer those questions by saying whether you think it's incompatible with the flood zone, whether the sequential test is required and is the exception test required? Okay. I can still see the answers coming in. Everyone's frantically Googling the PPG. <laughs> I hope you uh, use the opportunity to save it as a favorite. Okay, they seem to have just about stabilized. Good stuff. Um, so the answer to the first question was no, the development is not incompatible with the flood zone. Question two was yes, the sequential test is required. Um, but the exception test is not required. So well done to those who got those answers are correct. I can see from the, the results that there's quite a, quite a split split between the different answers. So uh, yeah, good chance to, uh, to to check on those things. Okay, let's move on to the second second case study. So this involves the construction of a single dwelling. It's in flood zone one but it is at high risk of surface water flooding. Again, it's a windfall application, not an allocated site. And again, the questions are the same. Is the development incompatible with the flood zone? Is the sequential test required? And is the exception test required? Okay, good stuff. How did everyone do? Okay, let's move on to the third case study. Um, so no, sorry, the answers for that were uh, no, the development is, is uh, not incompatible with the flood zone and the sequential test is required and the exception test is not required. Okay, so next, next one. So this involves the construction of 25 dwellings. It's in flood zone one, uh, but a new strategic flood risk assessment shows high risk of flooding from rivers in future because of the impacts of climate change. It is on a site that's been allocated for housing through the sequential test. The old local plan, SFRA, showed a low risk of current and future flood risk from, from rivers. So again, is the development incompatible with the flood zone? Is the sequential test required and is the exception test required? Good stuff. Thanks, everyone. So no, the development is not incompatible with the flood zone, table two, 
suggest that's okay. If it's O1, um, sequential test is required um, because there has been a significant change in our understanding of flood risk since the site was allocated and subject to the sequential test. So we need to revisit the sequential test um, based on the new understanding of flood risk provided by that updated strategic flood risk assessment. Um, but no, the exception test is not required. Table two of the PPG only deals with present day flood risk in terms of flood zone one, two, and three. Good stuff. Okay, we've got two left. So the next one is the construction of nine dwellings. It's in flood zone three. It's on a site that's been allocated for commercial development through the sequential test. And again, is the development incompatible? Is the sequential test required? And is the exception test required? Thank you, everyone. So no, the development is not incompatible with the flood zone. Um, it's potentially compatible subject to the exception test. Um, the sequential test is required. Um, that's because the proposed use uh, is not consistent with the use for which it was allocated. It was allocated for a commercial use and it's residential use that's come forward. So the sequential test needs to be revisited. And yes, the exception test is required according to table two of the planning practice guidance. Right, moving on to the last case study, make sure you've all been paying attention. So this last one is for the construction of a commercial extension. It has a floor space of 240 square meters. It's in flood zone 3B and it's windfall development. So it's not on an allocated site. So is the development incompatible with the flood zone? Is the sequential test required? And is the exception test required? Do take a look at table two of PPG. Good stuff. So this one uh, was a yes, development is incompatible with the flood zone, less vulnerable development in flood zone 3B functional floodplain is incompatible according to table two of the PPG. Um, and that means there is no need to apply the sequential test or the exception test because the development is incompatible and should not be permitted on, on that basis alone. Good stuff. Right, should we try and attempt some Q&A then? Sam, let's, yeah, let's try and do that. And I'm just going to um, raise some of the ones that, are, <coughs> that have appeared uh, just quickly in, in all of that. Um, and I think just, just to go back to those quick case studies, Sam, if that's okay, there are sort of a couple of questions about going through one or two of those in more detail in terms of, uh, well, let me be honest about it. It's got a significant number of people plainly were not getting the right answer. That's all. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and just to reassure everyone, neither do I. So don't a, be a, a shocking indictment on the quality of my training <laughs> session. <laughs> so is it possible perhaps just to just to think about those? Uh, I, I think there's a set of questions in the q and I think which really are about clarity. 
um, in terms of definitions of flood zones from all sources of flooding, for example, and then precisely how those would apply. There's some questions also about the real fundamental difference in essence between um, the sequential test and the exception test. And I appreciate um, Sam, that this is not easy because this is policy constructed over, over many years. But I think perhaps yeah. any clarity on those issues, particularly I think about sources of information, you've been very clear about with practice guidance. Um, yeah. but also, there's quite a lot of questions about SFRA and guidance around that as well. So anything you, there's quite a lot that I've given you, so I'm sorry about that, but uh, there's quite a lot yeah. to get through. So the 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 case studies were designed to um, to to draw out um, a couple of issues. So the 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 first one was about compatibility. So that's about table two of the planning practice guidance, which in, it sets out those circumstances where development of a particular vulnerability is considered to be incompatible with certain flood zones and provides a, a clear steer that development should not be permitted in those circumstances. Table two is 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 based solely on the flood zones, so it only considers flood risk from rivers and the sea, and it only considers present day risk because that's how the flood zones are currently defined. So in terms of determining whether the exception test is required and whether development is incompatible, it, it, it's, it's just on the basis of the flood zones. They're also designed to, to test people's understanding of the, the minor, non-major and, and major development categories. Um, so that, that, that was drawn out as well. Um, and, and certainly in, in understanding what can trigger the sequential test, they were designed to show that it considers all sources of current and future flood risk. So one of the case studies was in flood zone one, so a low risk of flooding from rivers of the sea, but was at risk from surface water flooding. So that alone can be sufficient to trigger the need for the sequential test. Another example showed it was a, a present day low risk from rivers in the sea, but but is expected to be a, a high risk in, in future due to climate change. That is enough to trigger the need for, for the sequential test as well. So the, the case studies were very much designed to, to, to draw out those particular nuances thanks sam and, and i think there's more information in you know in relation to that in, in the practice guidance and more guidance about strategic flood risk assessments where i want to just pick up a couple of questions that the environment agency has produced um, um, uh, around that but there was one question early on and you know, we have a long list of questions uh, about how um uh, sequential exception tests might be applied effectively to permitted development barn conversions and everyone will be aware of the expansion of that method of consent could you please say a little bit about about that my my very limited understanding is that yes in prior approval you should be considering flood risk but there's a fundamentally different approach to considering it than from perhaps a standard new application can you help, help us with that yeah, so most permitted development rights that result in residential development do have a prior approval for, for flood risk. Um, flood risk assessment should be provided, and um, we will be con the environment agency will be con consulted in those in those cases. Um, in most cases, they will be changes of use, Hugh, and change of use development is exempt from the sequential test, so wouldn't need to be applied. Um, there is a permitted development right, Class ZA, I think it is, off the top of my head, which permits the demolition of, of existing commercial development and the construction of new residential development. Our view is that in those circumstances, they should be subject to the sequential test, uh, but I'm not aware of that having been, been tested. It's not a, a, a permitted development class that is uh, regularly utilised. Okay. Um, uh... There's a couple of questions I'm going to do as feedback, I think, about clarity on on, on them, whether the guidance is entirely clear uh, around those issues. Can we say a quick word about strategic flood risk assessments? Again, just trying to group the questions um, uh, around that issue. It seems to me um, that there's really a fundamental importance uh, if you're going to apply these two tests successfully in having up-to-date uh, strategic flood risk assessments in play. Um, and obviously that can be quite complex depending on what kind of authority you're in. Please, can you tell me uh, what an up, what up to date strategic flood risk assessment means? So there's a, a a bit of a historical tendency for strategic flood risk assessments to be produced um, solely to inform local plan preparation, and then they sort of sit on a shelf for five years. 
But it's really important to remember that the strategic flood risk assessment forms the basis for applying the sequential test to individual planning applications on an ongoing basis. And of course, because flood risk information changes all the time as new hydraulic models are produced, as significant flood, flood events are experienced, as the climate change allowances are updated, it's really important that flood risk information in strategic flood risk assessments are kept up to date so that they form a, a credible evidence base for applying the sequential test. Um, we produce two bits of guidance. I, I mentioned them in, uh, in in the presentation, the gov.uk guidance on how to prepare a strategic flood risk assessment and its sort of companion good practice guidance. And they both advocate for SFRAs being prepared in a way which is um, digital, web-based, which separates the text report parts of the, of the uh, SFRAs from the maps so that they can be more readily updated on an ongoing basis without having to throw the whole SFRA in the bin and starting from scratch, which clearly is not practical or affordable for local planning authorities to do. So designing SFRA so that they can be cheaply and simply uh, kept up to date is, is, a, is a really important component of success, successful SFRA preparation these days. Thanks, Sam. And just one specific question. I'm not going to read the names out, but uh, but the one specific question is that our strategic flood risk assessment maps don't differentiate between flood zones 3A and 3B. What should our approach be for applications in flood zone 3 if we don't know what the exact uh, what exact zone applies? Yeah, so uh, local authorities are tasked in their SFRAs with identifying functional floodplain, um, but often practice means that functional floodplain is only identified in locations where there is a detailed hydraulic model that enables them to do that. Um, our advice at the moment is where there's an absence of information on whether functional floodplain might be present, that maps should be clear about that, it should be clear that in, in any particular location that it's unknown if functional floodplain is present. If site allocations, prospective site allocations are being considered in the, then lo those sorts of locations, the SFRA will need to do additional work to, uh, to identify functional floodplain. If not, and this only applies to, to planning applications that come forward in due course, then you should be putting the onus on planning applicants in their site-specific flood risk assessments to identify the presence or absence of functional floodplain. Okay. Things will get much easier in future, though, Hugh, because the Environment Agency is about to produce its uh, second national flood risk assessment, which will uh, allow us to map functional floodplain uh, or the flood scenario that is associated with functional floodplain uh, everywhere. So from next summer, it'll be much easier uh, to, to, to map functional floodplain across all locations. I'm definitely going to hold you, Sam, to the fact that it will be much easier next summer uh, to deal with flood risk in this country. <laughs> um, uh, but what is, what's a local authority meant to do in the decision-making process when their strategic flood risk assessment is uh, dated and hasn't considered the, the latest climate change flood risk allowances? H how are they to be applied? So when a developer is producing a site-specific flood risk assessment, it's incumbent on them to, to assess all sources of current and future flood risk. Uh, and if the SFRA uh, hasn't included analysis on the latest climate change allowances, then the owner should be put on the developer to do that in their, in their flood risk assessment. Okay, and I've got a quick question, which is, should I consult on applications for dwellings in flood, flood zone two, uh, consult the EA, that is? My initial view is I do, but I did in the past receive consultation responses from the EA saying no consultation required. Yeah, so one of the things that the Environment Agency does um, to um, make the most of our limited resources so that we focus our effort on those highest risk locations is we have something called National Flood Risk Standing Advice, uh, which sets out the circumstances where we want to be consulted, where we'll provide bespoke advice. Uh, and in lower risk circumstances, that we provide standardised advice. Um, and we've applied standing advice for most development, including residential development in Flood Zone 2. So in those circumstances, local authorities should refer to our standing advice uh, rather than consulting the Environment Agency. And I've got a group of questions, so I'm sorry to bombard you with this, but that's what we're here for. We've got a group of questions about um, the sequential approach and how local authorities should assess whether the evidence of alternate sites uh, uh, being provided by developers 
is actually sufficient. I wanted to draw out something that it seemed to me that you said was really important about whether or not that th in relation to five-year land supply, because that argument was being applied quite powerfully, wasn't it? Well, if you don't have five-year land supply, then then somehow or other that circumvents the policy process. Can you yeah. just help us understand what you think kind of um, a, a, an excellent process would be in understanding what other sites were, were available, either in terms of what a developer should provide to a local authority or what the local authority should be doing? Yeah, so last summer's planning guidance update really changed the roles and responsibilities a bit on, on the sequential test. Um, acknowledging, I think, that um, local authorities are, are, are best placed to understand um it's spatial strategy, sort of strategic housing land availability um, because of the work that local authorities do do in that space for preparing their lo local local plans. There was also the issue of if all the onus was placed on the developers to identify alternative sites and to say whether or not the sequential test was passed, the um, Turkey's voting for Christmas phenomenon came into play uh, and it wasn't often a very credible or robust process that resulted from that. Um, so I think local authorities are far better placed to have awareness of strategic land availability, um, to be able to form an informed view on what an appropriate search area is for a particular development type, and ultimately to determine whether the test has been satisfied. The, the challenge is that a local authority won't necessarily have bang up to date information about housing land availability, the status of those sites, whether they're actually available or whether development has take place, taken place, for example. And really the the, the role of, of applicants is quite narrow now in identify, identifying any open market sites that a local authority isn't aware of through a sort of strategic land um, uh, assessment role um, and to check the status of, of sites. I think for me, the, uh, the, the perfect situation is a local authority keeping an up-to-date register of reasonably available sites with their ranking, um, for risk ran ranking next to them so that when an application comes in, you establish where the planning applicant application is on that ranking. And if there are any reasonably, reasonably available sites above it in that ranking um, within the search area, then the sequential test is effectively not, not satisfied. It makes for a quick uh, and consistent process. Um, and just a, a quick supplementary, Sam, some authorities have moved, haven't they, to adopt some parts of flood risk assessment processes um, through supplementary planning guidance, for example, in their own policy or made it clear informally in their own policy. Presumably that's something to be encouraged. Yes, I think so. Although the fate of supplementary planning documents is a little bit un unknown in the context of the levelling up um, uh, proposals. Um I, in future, I suspect that, that the, those sorts of uh, guidance documents would have the status of guidance. But um, but yeah, uh, doing that thinking at a local level to account for local circumstances, I think he's still going to have a have an important role to play. Right. I'm, obviously, we've just been feeding the easy questions so far at you, Sam, to warm you up for, for this. Uh, this is a more complex one. Um, uh, should local planning authorities treat a sequential test as passed? If the layout within a site segregates uses and places them into parts of the sites where those uses are compatible with the fund with the vulnerability and flood zones, so I guess that's about larger sites. Yeah, yeah, I think yes, I think that's reasonable. I think if buildings um, and access and escape routes are being kept wholly out of all sources of current and future flood risk areas, then I, I think it's I think it's reasonable not to apply the sequential test in those circumstances. Um, yeah. And and there was a, a, a question earlier on about which just comes to mind about access, you know, in terms of if, if the access route is in a, a higher risk flood plane than the, the actual development itself, you know, how, how to handle that that problem. Uh, yeah, I, in my view, that could be enough to trigger the sequential test. Um, all, all development uh, should be provided with safe access and escape routes. Um, that are designed to allow free and voluntary movement during a design flood. Uh, they should be dry, um, but very low levels of flood risk might be acceptable if they can't be can't be kept dry. Um, so yes, and, uh, enough to trigger the sequential test and a really important consideration. 
So um, again, I'm jumping around again because we're short of time, uh, just coming to some, picking up some questions at the end that are more detailed. Um, so here's a, 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 another one to push you over the edge. How should we deal with an application in flood zone 3B that table two says should not be permitted, but where there are overriding benefits and the only theoretical flood risk, it's built above flood, flood level and only a theoretical flood risk because the building is built above the flood level. Can we still proceed with a recommendation to approve even with a conflict with table two? Um, so... It's worth bearing in mind there are uh, there are a number of reasons why functional floodplain, in my view, has the level of protection afforded to it in, in policy and guidance. The first is because there are areas that are that, that flood with the greatest frequency and are likely to have the greatest severity of, of flooding, being proximal to, to rivers in most cases. But so risk to the development that results from locating development in areas of functional floodplain is an important consideration. But functional floodplain are also areas where water has to flow and be stored during times of flood. Um, and so it's really important that those areas are safeguarded so that water isn't displaced elsewhere um, and that the river can continue to be connected uh, in a natural way to its, to its floodplain. Clearly, there, there, there can be exceptions to these rules if there are overriding uh, reasons in any particular circumstance. I think if you're considering um, granting planning permission in a situation where planning guidance says it should not be permitted, you should probably also go through the sequential and exception test process as well, even, even, even though, strictly speaking, they're, they're not necessary. Um, but at least that would, would go through the process of justifying that there aren't alternative sites uh, and that the proposed development is exceptionally necessary. I can't hear you, Hugh. That's because I was muting myself, which I'm sure was a great comfort to everybody. So just as we're coming to the end, trying to pick up uh, one issue which is reflected um, sort of implicit in a number of questions. And I can see someone asking me, where am I getting these questions from? And they're in the 51 questions in the Q&A, if, if anyone's interested. And if you still want to try and ask something, please do put it into the Q&A, because that's what I'm... That's what I'm focused on uh, and looking at. Th there is um, some confusion, not least in my mind, uh, uh, having spent too long in planning about these, um, th about the size and scale of these three definitions of development. I'm looking for reassurance in terms of uh, minor, non-minor, and major. That because because you're aware that there, there are other definitions um, in, in 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 planning guidance. Yeah. That people need to be one hundred percent focused on those three categories. Is that right? Can you can you put some emphasis behind that? Because I can see people um, being slightly confused that there are other definitions out there. Oh yeah, ab ab absolutely. It's very confusing and it's extremely unhelpful, frankly. That <laughs> the different definitions are used in different contexts, and it's clearly the the, the root cause of the confusion. And um, I hope the presentation was clear in that respect. Planning guidance is on flood risk is really clear about about these, um, but the the survey that we did was concerning, um, and the sequential test clearly isn't being applied in many circumstances where it it should be. Uh, I've got a lot of sympathy for local authorities because uh, clearly, com in common usage, is the term uh, minor development to refer to the non major development category in this in this context. So it's no wonder really that. Um, that confusion has arisen. Um, but I, th I think the, the, the big one to remember is a proposal for a single dwelling is is, an, is enough to trigger trigger the need for the sequential test. So, yeah, yeah. hopefully, if, if uh, probably if government were reviewing all their planning policy and guidance and all the associated processes in one go, they might take the opportunity to resolve the, uh, the confusion and the, 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 the conflicts in the names. But... Uh, yeah. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately. I think some people need to be really focused on that because at the end of the day, there are many issues in planning. This is life and death. So, you know, um, that definition is the one that needs to apply and be ingrained on the back of our brains, I think, uh, yeah. moving forward. And I think in itself, it is helpful in terms of the culture change that most forms of development um, uh, are really captured by, apart from extremely small forms. One final question then, um, given the time, and I promise we will finish in four minutes, so you have very short period to answer this quite long question. On more than one occasion, my authority has been in receipt of flood risk assessment that concludes site designated by the EA mapping as flood zone two and three are in reality flood zones while on the ground as 
for, for a variety of reasons. On this basis, it's argued the sequential test should not apply. We've taken the view sequential test is still required given its designation, but following a common sense approach. This doesn't necessarily sit well with applicants, agents and local members. Do you have any comment on this? Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a relatively common scenario. Um, so the, the, the mapping that results in the in the flood zones uh, is of uh, varying quality. Sometimes it's re really accurate, up, up to date, based on a detailed hydraulic model. In other locations, it's based on a, 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 a less high resolution national model. Uh, with more uncertainty associated with it so it's um you know not impossible for situations where there are inaccuracies and a developer can reasonably do more detailed site specific work and come up with a more accurate outline of of the flood zones um we we we, we have a process at the environment agency um where the flood zone outlines can be sort of formally challenged it's called an evidence review request um usually the onus <clears throat> Are you okay, Sam? I'm not sure Sam is okay, actually. Tell me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> no, that's fine. That's fine. Try to finish off, I think, if you can, and then I'll I'll try and finish off the session. <laughs> So developers can challenge challenge the flood zones. If they go through that process, um, the next quarterly update for the flood zones, the outline would be would be changed and it would officially become a different flood zone. My only caveat is that the sequential test, as I've made clear, is triggered by all sources of current and future flood zone. So even if a developer shows a site is in flood zone one, we also need to be careful that once we add climate change into flood risk we need to make sure that those those sites wouldn't be in flood zone two or three in future within the development's lifetime so certainly in the context of the sequential test it doesn't necessarily mean um a get out from the sequential test okay let's uh draw this to a close because we promised we would be uh, uh on time just a quick um, uh, mention of the resources available from the TCPA, uh, which includes some case studies and policy case studies. And then moving quickly on, there is a survey that the Environment Agency, next slide, really wants coastal authorities to take on. I know you get bombarded with surveys, but please do uh, feedback on that. Uh, my apologies in a short session like this, which is convenient, which is great for people I know in their busy lives, but doesn't give us an awful lot of time. There's lots of unanswered questions. We're taking them all, recording them all. Um, and we're going to feed them back into the e-learning resources, which please look out for because they're coming down the line uh, over the next few months. And we really hope those learning resources will be um, valuable to you. There's a, um, a quick survey you can take about the value of these sessions. Um, and I'll just leave you with this thought, really, uh, um, about uh, on, on a rainy afternoon, certainly looking at the River Derwent. Um, this, is, this isn't easy. It's a tough territory with complex policy. But it is so important we get this right, particularly for the economic and social fabric of our communities. And certainly the job you're doing, which I'm sure can feel frustrating, demoralised, and I'm sure many of you are thinking on this call, where the hell do they expect us to get the resources from to do this properly, given the challenges there are to the planning service. But this is so fundamental um, to, to the future of our, our communities and, of course, Planners uh, will recognise the fact that in a changing climate, these impacts are going to become extreme. They're going to become more difficult and people are going to ask us questions about how we are planning for them in a way that gives people a hopeful future. Thank you all so much for joining this hour session. We have another one next week. And if there's any resources that are useful to you, there's, there's quite a lot focused on the TCPA website as well. So thank you again. And uh, we look forward to having a uh, resilient future.